I'm going to move this so that I don't keep hitting that. <laughs> All right. Quacks and woohoos are appreciated. I am hard of hearing, and so uh, if, if God is speaking to you in a way, uh, which is the whole purpose of why we're here, feel free to respond. You're not going to offend me, I promise. Let's read James chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. Let's pray. Father, I pray that this morning as we read your word together, God, that your words would be what is heard and not mine. God, I pray that uh, our time and worship together would allow us to grow in our knowledge, in grace, in our faith, and in love for you and for those around us. We love you, and it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. So, um, it was funny... We, my wife and I and our family moved here uh, about two months ago um, today, uh, and so uh, our first day was two months ago, and uh, yeah, it was really exciting. Um, and when, when Pastor Nathan was like, hey, I'm going to give you an opportunity to preach, I was like, sweet, what am I preaching on? And he told me the passage, and I was like, oh, cool, I don't really remember what that is, and then I read it, and I was like, oh, I see why you have me preaching. Um, so... The last couple weeks have been um, fun, and it's going to continue to be fun. So, uh, The late 17th and early 18th century Puritan minister and commentator, Matthew Henry, you may know him from the Matthew Henry commentary, it's about that thick, but actually, really, it's about that thick because it's condensed. But um, in his uh, commentary on 1 Timothy chapter 4, he has the following to say, those who teach by their doctrine must teach by their life. Amen. Or else they pull down with one hand what they build up with the other. Um, I don't know if you're familiar uh, by a show of hands with the game Jenga. This, okay, so some of you know what that is. Okay, if you don't know, Jenga is a game that you play, usually with kids um, or adults, you know, at a... At a, at a outside restaurant, and they've got the giant one, right? Um, but it has blocks, wood blocks, and usually there's three on the bottom that are laid side by side, and then there's three that go the opposite way, or the, you know, left to right, and then so on and so forth until it's a big tower. And the way that you play is you take one by one, you take one piece out without knocking the whole tower over, and you place it on the top. And the, the, the hitch is you can't touch anything else other than that one piece. Everybody understand the concept of Jenga? Okay. So um, as a student pastor, I uh, pride myself on the fact that I am a self-proclaimed professional Jenga player. Um, I heard a doubt it, and that kind of hurt my feelings. Okay. But if you've ever played, there's nothing better than getting that one block that's like wedged in there on the bottom layer and you're able to get it out and then get it back on top without the whole thing toppling over so you know that the next person in line is just going to absolutely mess it up, right? You, you know that you're pretty safe there. But unfortunately, as it turns out, a, a masterful Jenga technique does not translate to being a good brick layer, for instance. You do not want someone like me with my skill set, my resume for building, including Jenga and Lego, uh, you do not want me building your house. For those of us who teach, we must teach by our doctrine. We also must teach by how we live our lives. If we don't practice what we preach, we are like a bricklayer who uses the Jenga technique to build a house that is prone to crumble at any moment. Likewise, whenever we sit under preaching and teaching, all of us, teachers included, we must be like the family for whom the house is built, scrupulously discerning the difference between a well-built house and one that would be a hazard to live in. 
Um, over the last few weeks, we, we've been going through the book of James, and we've, we've been talking um, specifically recently about faith and works, and how a real, true, living faith is one that results in works of righteousness. James give us, gives us um, examples, and we talked about it last week, of people like Abraham and Rahab, who, um, whose faith moved them to action. And like I said, James really loves stepping on toes. And I want you to remember that while we go through this, um, it is James that's stepping on your toes. And by uh, virtue of the Bible being the inspired word of God, um, you might be having your toes stepped on by God's word. And so I want you to remember that. Um, you know, we're, we're about five minutes in. We're going to be 15 minutes in, and you may want to throw something at me. But uh, remember whose words these are. So uh, grab your steel-toed boots and strap in. We're going to begin um, going through uh, verse 1. There's only two verses today. But James begins uh, in verse 1, and he begins it with a stern warning. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers. Now, for those of you who are more in tune with the Gen Z language, um, a lot of times when someone's going to tell you something that they think might offend you, they say, my brother in Christ, you got to know, those shoes don't go with that jacket, or whatever it is. Um, So this kind of feels like a, uh, like a, like a, you have a face for radio kind of, kind of, comment from James, Um, but he continues with it, and he says, um, he says, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Now, the word that we have, um, the English word teacher, um, is didaskalos, in the Greek. And so one of my favorite things to do when I get the opportunity to preach um, is to uh, teach a new word. And so today we're going to learn a new Greek word, didaskalos. And so I'm going to ask you on the count of three to say the word didaskalos, and then I'm going to tell you what it means. All right? One, two, three. Didaskalos. Great. Y'all sound so good. So this word in the Greek is actually used throughout the Gospels when uh, people refer to, often refer to Jesus, and we translate it most often as the word master. And so whenever we hear it, um, when, we, when we see it further on in uh, past the Gospels in the New Testament, um, it's usually translated to teacher or spiritual leader. And so when you hear this, um, this entreatment from James know that he is speaking to those who are in, in spiritual authority, who are, who are spiritually leading one or many people. And this warning that James gives comes in perfect harmony with other texts that we have concerning elders. And um, we're going there's, there's, we're to be scripture heavy today because we only have a couple of verses and they're a little bit difficult to understand And so what we should do as Christians who believe that the Bible is the infallible word of God is we should use Scripture to interpret Scripture. So we're going to read 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 7. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer or elder, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, He must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. And Titus chapter 1, verses 7 through 9 adds to that, for an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, 
a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who would contradict it. Scripture makes it very clear to us that being a teacher, an elder, a spiritual leader, these things are not to be taken lightly. So, um, many of you might be sitting there thinking to yourself, well, I'm glad that we have that instruction, but I'm not a, an elder or a deacon or uh, even a Sunday school teacher. Um, I, I don't spiritually lead many people. What does this all have to do with me? And I'm really glad that you asked. Ephesians chapter 4 gives us um, a little bit of insight into that for you. So um, verses 11 through 16 of Ephesians chapter 4 says this, And he, that's God, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds or pastors and teachers to equip the saints. Who are the saints? Us, believers. He gave these people to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes, rather speaking truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when every part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. I want you to note, when Paul is telling them why God gave them the prophets and the teachers and the shepherds, the, the pastors, the elders. Notice that it didn't say to do the work of ministry in your town. It didn't say, I gave you these people so that you can go get your friends that you're too scared to talk to about your faith and bring them to the church house so that they can hear. That wouldn't be a terrible thing to do. But what, what does it say? It says they are there to equip you, to equip the saints to do the work of ministry. The people who lead you spiritually are there and they're given to you in order to equip you, to build up the body of Christ, to ensure that you are not tossed about by the waves and carried, carried away by every convincing false doctrine that you hear. They're there to preach the word of God to you so that you are not deceived when people twist it to mean something that it doesn't mean. Every single one of us has spiritual leaders in our life who are helping us build our house. And if you're not paying attention, you're liable to have some Jenga player setting you up for failure. Because I promise you, the waves will come. The wind will come. People in your life will use God's word with a twisted interpretation or out of context in order to deceive you. So let's continue uh, in James chapter 3, verse 2. Um, he, he says, Not many of you should become teachers because you know that we'll be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle his whole body. And there are just a few things that I want to note here. Number one, James, uh, when, he is, uh, w when he talks about stumbling, he, he doesn't say um, these teachers, they stumble in many ways. He uses a shorter word, the word we. He says, for we all stumble in many ways. He includes himself. 
And the second thing is that, that when he says stumble, this isn't talking about um, a grievous fall from grace that would disqualify someone from leadership, such as um, living an unrepentant lifestyle of sin or a habitual sin. But rather, he's talking about the kind of struggle that we all have against our flesh nature. It, it can be translated as um, stumble, but it can also be translated as offend. And this is offend in relation to God's standard of perfection. We all stumble. The third thing that I thought was, was notable here is that he says if someone does not stumble in what he says, if someone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man. And we know um, just from what we've heard in the last few weeks and, and also from throughout Scripture that the heart comes out through where? The mouth. The mouth. What, what is here is going to come out through our mouth. What we say and how we say it reveals our hearts. Jesus says in Luke chapter 6, verses 43 through 45, and also in Matthew chapter 11, For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are, the grapes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. And the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart... His mouth speaks. Over the coming weeks, we're going to continue in James chapter 3, where he's going to uh, get more into the weeds on um, the tongue and on our words. But what you need to know is that our tongue reveals what's in our hearts. And since we all stumble, since we all stumble, this is something that we must pay attention to. So what do we do with all of this? We have these two verses here where James roasts his brothers and um, tells them, hey, maybe you shouldn't all become teachers um, because we're all going to be judged with greater strictness because everyone stumbles, right? How do we apply this to tomorrow? How do we apply it to our life in 2024 at the beaches of all places? If you're a teacher, if you are a spiritual leader, if you are a, an elder, a deacon, a Sunday school teacher, look at me. One of the things that you're going to have to do is to count the cost. Our words matter a great deal. Proverbs twelve eighteen. For teachers, for us, our words matter if we're careless with our words, we have the potential to unjustly offend those who we are called to love. We also have the opportunity and the potential to muddle the image of Jesus that we are to reflect in how we live our own lives. And if we're not careful, we even have the potential to disqualify ourselves from teaching altogether. If you are already a teacher, an elder, a pastor, a deacon, a spiritual leader, steel-toed boots, okay? If you are one of these people and your heart and your tongue and your life would cause you to be embarrassed standing before a holy God because you've been living in unrepentant sin or you have otherwise disqualified yourself, it is your responsibility to remove yourself from that position. And I guarantee you, I promise you, it will be much better to have a bruised ego than the alternative. Do not be a Jenga player building shoddy houses for God's beloved children. The last thing that I would say for teachers, for, for leaders, is to take seriously the call in your life to be a spiritual leader because in my own life, it has been one of the most joyful rewarding, difficult, arduous, frustrating 
things that you could possibly do. Now, if you are not a teacher, if you are someone who says, you know what, that's awesome. Um, but that's not me. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a follower of Christ. I live my life. I'm not, I'm not in spiritual I'm not an elder, I'm not a deacon, I'm not a teacher, I'm not a pastor. You must exercise discernment. You know what discerning is? Separating out things, rightly dividing things, um, eating the meat and spitting out the bones. You must exercise discernment with regard to whose spiritual leadership you sit under. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3-5 through five says, If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up in, in conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words, which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. So for those of you who are not teachers, let me have your eyes. If the spiritual leaders in your life are marked by these things, you must run. You must flee from that as fast as you can. Do not allow a Jenga player to build your house. The second thing that you can do if you're not a teacher, if you're not an elder, a spiritual leader, um, and even if you are, you can pray for the spiritual leaders in your own life. We can all do that. We can pray for our leaders because we all stumble in many ways. Listen, from the, from the moment that we are justified, right, you know, we, we have this moment where, where God pierces our hearts and we, um, we are given the gift of faith and belief. And we trust Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior at that moment of justification all the way until the moment where we are with him in glory and perfected. Every single ounce of time in between, we are being sanctified. And that's a big, long church word that just means we're being made to look more like Christ every single day. So pray for us. That we would stumble less and less as we continue to be made more like Christ. Amen? Amen.